everybody welcome to our first call of 2021 storytelling community nice to see everybody's faces i was just thinking this morning walking in the rain actually that um the last time we gathered it was for magic and mixology in december um, which was also a whole lot of fun but that seems like a long time ago and um glad to have you all back here now um wanted to mention that we are going to have some upcoming events hopefully continued monthly gatherings to look forward to so check the channel and keep an eye out for that um we're also getting sunday storytellers going again which has been fun to see some of the participation around that so Please continue to bring your ideas and your stories. Um, but today, we are so fortunate to have Ian Sanders join us. Um, Steve introduced me to Ian a couple months ago, and we've been connecting, um, sharing a, a shared affinity for Billy Bragg, which I hope you tell us a little bit about, and and also for this uh, coastal town that, that you come from, um, Steve just said southern coast of England. I, I meant to look it up. You'll have to show us on the map. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay. So Ian, Ian is joining us in the evening, um, but uh, really I've just been enjoying getting to know you and talking about stories and talking about why we tell them, why they matter, and how it um, impacts the work that we do. And uh, Ian has worked um, and thought a lot about this topic uh, for a variety of clients and engagements, everything from the General Assembly to the BBC, and uh, presently he's doing some work with Ericsson. So, you know, just a, a broad experience, um, thinking about how we can all use story in our daily lives. And uh, he's going to tell us some stories today and talk a little bit about those principles and uh, also leave us with some practical tips. And uh, I know he's got a lot of great things to talk about, so I don't want to take up any more time. Oh, as always, though, please do in the chat, ask questions. Um, we'll pause if necessary and answer them. We'll try to leave a few minutes at the end to, to get to questions as well. So with that, welcome, Ian, and uh, good evening over there. Hey, hey thanks, Amy. Uh, it's great to be with you all today. I know a lot of you are on uh, Pacific time, so good morning to you. It's great to have people from all over the world. And uh, I just I just showed Amy while we were waiting for the call. I have a nice little prop here, which is my childhood globe. And uh, I know in a digital world, isn't it lovely to have something analog? I've done a handy little just trying to go in on the camera there. Handy little sticky arrow of like, where the heck am I? Where is Ian Sanders? I'm in uh, the town of Leon C, 40 miles kind of to the east of London. I just put this globe over here. Um, uh, and that's where I'm joining you from uh, today. And you know, just kind of getting the globe out, I felt super nostalgic for like taking a journey. I'm sure most of us would normally be traveling in our work lives. I don't know about you, but uh, I know from some, I know from uh, from Steve Clayton's uh, newsletter last week, him talking about his love of taking journeys. It's really important for me. So all I can offer you in the absence of getting on a plane and going around a globe is um, I want to take you on a journey for the next 50 minutes or so to share my passion for storytelling with you and uh, it's the evening here so it feels a little cozy and when I talk about stories and storytelling I love to kind of imagine we're sitting around the fire so I know it's a sunny morning there in Seattle but that's the vibe I'd like us to have if you can use your imagination and uh, pretend we're uh, sitting around a fire. So I've got um, a lot of stories I want to share with you today and most of those are from the world of work from business and brands and organizations. Because what I wanna do is I wanna get each of you energized about how you use the power of stories uh, and storytelling uh, at work in your respective roles at Microsoft. Uh, but I know what I also would wanna do today on this session is, um, is just share some stories that are just good stories, right? Because that's the whole point of storytelling. I think it's really important that when we're looking for inspiration for stories that we can take inspiration from other worlds and genres. So I want to start with telling you about a film. Some of you may have seen it because uh, it was a great story. Uh, it was a film I saw over the holiday period uh, available on Netflix. It was made in 2019 and it's called Les Miserables. Uh, not, not, the, uh, not the musical, but it is a French language film. 
It's made by a Parisian filmmaker called Large Lee. He was born in Mali and uh, it's set in the Banlieu, the housing projects that surround the city of Paris. <laughs> so if you, if you want to get a feel for it, if you're familiar with Emily in Paris, the other Netflix show, think of Emily in Paris and it's basically nothing like it. It's gritty, it's real. And I found it outstanding storytelling inspired by the filmmaker's own story growing up in the Banlieu outside Paris. He bought, when he was 17, a DV camera and he used to film what was happening in the neighbourhood. He filmed friends, family, uh, the police, and also he was there filming for the 2005 Paris riots, if you remember about that. The story in Les Miserables um, is about the tension, I guess, between the locals and the police, and also police brutality. And very much based on his own story, the film features a young boy documenting life in the housing projects with a drone, with a, with a camera drone. The New York Times said it was a movie torn from the pages of the filmmaker's life. I love that line, which is why I wanna share it with you. And the film made a real impact on me. And it also made a real impact on someone uh, perhaps a bit more important than me. It made an impact on President Emmanuel Macron, who apparently left him really quite shaken when he watched the movie. And so much so, he instructed his advisors to do something about life in the housing projects. And he said to those advisors, you have to go and see this film. And I thought about that when I read that article, actually it was in the Financial Times, a review of the film in there. And I thought, yeah, he only did that. Emmanuel Macron only was moved to think about policy and to think about life for citizens living in that part of the city because he was touched by the story. And that is the power of a story when you get a president to take action. So check it out. And uh, by the way, uh, I've got a PDF that Amy will be winging around with um, uh, resources and links to all these things so you don't have to make a note of them. So I just want to give you a quick tour around the Ian Sanders kind of story where it all started for me. I started out on the storytelling path as a kid. Um, it was quite odd because for the first 10 years of my life, I grew up without a television set. That was really weird in the 1970s. I mean, imagine that now, a household with no screens. I spent a lot of time um, listening to the radio, reading, and I think that is where my storytelling habits started. Then when I was about 10, my dad brought home from work a kind of corporate gift he'd been given by a customer who worked in a bank. And it was a little tiny red radio about, um, about this high, height of a AA battery. It was a transistor radio. And in the late 70s in the UK, I'd never seen one of these. I had seen these big bulky radio sets. That little red radio was kind of like a love affair for me. It sparked an ambition for me as a young boy to work in broadcasting, to work in and around storytelling. And as I got into my teenage years, it became a real dream. My headmaster at school thought um, it wasn't a great idea for me to be pursuing an interest in media and wanting to go to university to do a degree in media and communication. And he suggested I give up on that ambition. Um, you'll be pleased to hear. I ignored him. And when I was 17, so kind of still at school, I got my lucky break when BBC local radio came to my home county uh, of Essex. And I knocked very firmly on that door and they needed young people to get involved in the launch of that radio station. And I got my lucky break reading the gig guide and doing interviews. Suddenly there I was working in radio while I was still at school. And my lovely moment of teenage dream came true, came full circle when um, I got the opportunity to suggest some people I might want to interview. And I was a real fan of Mr. Billy Bragg, as, uh, as Amy said. Uh, we share that passion and uh, I went and interviewed Billy. So my teenage dream had come true. So over the uh, last 30 years, story has been a real constant theme of my career, a journey that's taken me um, running workshops for the BBC, uh, writing for the Financial Times. I've written four books on work and business. Uh, it's even taken me to the top of the uh, Swiss Alps at Davos 
well, I've worked uh, for the World Economic Forum's digital media team at the, uh, the annual meeting there. So uh, it's been quite a journey. So what I'd like to do, uh, just to put my glasses on for this bit, I've just got some slides to take you through to the next uh, section. So um, hopefully you can see that. I'm just going to bring my slide deck up and well, here we go. I've got some slides to take you through uh, the next bit. Um, so really, this is just a bit of a refresher. I know all of you at Microsoft and everyone on this call are kind of fellow storytelling evangelists, which is fantastic. Um, and now I have my own story out of the way. I want to shine a light on a bunch of stories that might inspire you in your own storytelling efforts in 2021. And at the essence of, of it um, is this sense of stories being magnetizing. You know, we are all sociable animals, aren't we, us human beings? We do not sit around on Teams calls or in the old days in a pub or cafe, coffee shop, talking about um, you know, scientific data or mathematical data. We sit around and share stories. It's what Amy and I just did just naturally in the three or four minutes before we started on the hour. People have told stories for thousands of years. It's how knowledge and information got passed from generation to generation. We all know that. And that stories have the power to change our hearts and minds, to emotionally engage, to spark our imagination, I think stories are like our natural language. They have great potential in the world of work. And when we share our stories, it can connect others to our products and services, to our ideas, our brands and our businesses. So I've got an example of a great story I want to share with you, which all relates to red wine. And, and I guess at the heart of this, is, yeah, it's a story about wine, but it's also a reminder about how stories can influence the choices we make when we buy something, whether that's B2B or B2C. And this red wine uh, I discovered about um, six years ago when I went to the local wine store, it's literally like two minutes up the road there, uh, and asked for a recommendation of red wine. And the husband and wife who then ran the business, uh, Sam and Charlie, said, there's this great Rioja here, and I think you'll like it. It's called Gran Cerdo. It's the kind of place where you go with a recommendation. I trust them absolutely. As I stood at the counter, they wrapped the bottle of wine in tissue paper. And as they did so, they told me a story. And sitting here, what, six years later, I can't remember how the wine tasted. I can't tell you the qualities of the wine on my palate. But I can remember the story because that's the lovely thing about stories. Stories are memorable. And the story about Gran Cerdo wine starts with a winemaker called Gonzalo Gonzalez. Growing up in the Rioja region of Spain in a winemaking family, he decides he wants to make wine the biodynamic way. So he puts a kind of startup business plan together, apparently. He goes to his local bank, says, this is the wine business I want to start, I want to borrow some money. The bank said no. They felt that wine was too risky an asset to lend money against. He was pretty fed up about that. Uh, he managed to get some funding from some friends and family. But when he came to launch the brand, he needed to give it a name. He decided to call it Gran Cerdo, translates as fat pig. If you can see on the slide here, uh, a, a pig with dollar bills stuffed in its mouth. And on the back of the label, which I've taken a photograph of you there, he really rails against those bank executives that denied him the money. He calls them greasy and sweaty corporate suits, really goes for it. But what I love about it is that the story is hard baked into the brand. I mean, how many how many Rioja wines are there out there? If you go to a wine store, or you go online to Whole Foods or wherever you buy your wine. How many wines are there out there? How many Riochas are there out there? How does a brand stand out? A brand can stand out with its story. And what I love about this example in a digital world is that I struggle to find this story online. There isn't a brand website. There isn't a social media feed. The story was passed human to human. That's how that spark gets passed. And here I am passing it on to you. So I love that uh, story.
I might, might go and drink a glass of it at the weekend. Um, so storytelling is a vehicle to get people to care. A story makes you feel something. And if you're giving a presentation at work and you work at Microsoft, you probably know that if you include a story, it makes it much more memorable and impactful. I didn't just show you um, a business plan or a bar chart of Grand Soto. I told you a human story. This photograph, if you can see on the right there, is my son. A few months, a few months, wish it was. A few years ago, we went to New York on vacation and uh, we went to uh, the wonderful Strand bookstore. And that's my son, Barney, uh, lost in books. He is not lost in the business plan section of Strand Bookstore. He's lost in the, you know, that's the young adult section. He's lost in stories. So here's a story that I love and I, I love telling a lot and, and I hope it might inspire uh, you if you're not familiar with it. Uh, I'd like you to meet Claire and David Hyatt. Claire and David Hyatt uh, live in the town of Cardigan in the west of Wales. I won't get the globe out again, but uh, basically, if you think of the UK, the country of Wales is on the west and Cardigan is about as far west as you can go. Beautiful, uh, right by the coast, beautiful countryside. There's not much there, but until the early noughties, there was a jeans factory in Cardigan that employed hundreds of people and it made thousands of pairs of jeans every week. And then sadly, it closed and all those jeans makers lost their job. Uh, and they didn't have anywhere else to work. There was no other jeans making factories for a start. David told me the story of him running in the hills above the town of Cardigan. He loves, uh, he loves running out there, rain or shine. Kudos to him. He said to me, you know what, Ian? I looked down on my town and I thought, Hollywood has its film studios. The town of Cardigan knows how to make jeans. Claire and David in 2012 started Hyatt Denim with a mission to get their town making jeans again, to give those jeans makers their jobs back. So if you buy a pair of Hyatt denim jeans, you know, and they're not the cheapest jeans in the, in the world, you're buying into the story to get that town making jeans again, whether you live in Seattle or Madrid, you're buying into that story. There's an emotional engagement. And 2012 turned out to be a pretty good year to be launching a direct to consumer brand. You know, they just sell the uh, jeans online. Because I think that digital tools have almost like democratized the story production and story distribution process. Hyatt Denim are small, they're the underdog. They don't have an advertising budget. How the heck do they compete on Levi's, uh, with Levi's? You know, how the heck is a brand that you've never heard of compete with a brand like Levi's? And the answer is they compete on their story. Instagram, Twitter have given them a channel where people will fall in love with their story and that spark gets passed and the consumers will say, wow, I love these jeans and they talk about them. In early 2018, I think it was, a woman went to Cardiff, the state capital of, uh, capital of Wales, with her then boyfriend and um, things kind of accelerated a bit, went a bit crazy. A woman fell in love with the brand and her name, can, can't see her from here, is uh, previously known as Meghan Markle. Well, I think they kind of rebranded uh, that she's back as Meghan Markle again. In 2018, she married Prince Harry. She went on a visit to Cardiff. Obviously, her stylists or advisors were like, she's got to wear some uh, Welsh fashion. And someone had heard of the Hyatt Denim story. She wore Hyatt Denim jeans. Suddenly, the factory and the website are inundated with inquiries as people all around the world who are interested in Meghan Markle's fashion, interest in the royal family, suddenly were very interested to know about Hyatt Denim jeans. And I would argue, I don't know the full story of uh, who it was in her advisors that found out about the jeans brand, but I would argue that if it wasn't for that story, that emotional engagement, engaging story, um, it, wouldn't have, uh, it wouldn't have happened. So stories change how we feel, okay? That's the power of, uh, of a story, to change how we feel. And I've got um, a nice example from, from stories changing how we feel from outside the business world, from a lovely storytelling platform or channel that I'm sure you're aware of, you might follow on socials, called Humans of New York. Uh, Humans of New York was started by a guy called Brandon Stanton, 
a humble guy really with a camera around his neck and a notepad who set out to create a photographic census of New York City. And if you follow Humans of New York, you'll know that it's now extended much beyond that and into video as well. But what I love about Humans of New York is it taps into the fact that stories are all around us. In usual times, I'm taking journeys, um, cities around Europe, uh, around the UK, and I love to walk around. I love to be nosy, sit in coffee shops, eavesdrop on strangers and think, what is their story? Because um, each of us has a unique story. The photograph I've chosen for the slide here is from Humans of New York uh, from December 2017. And I've cropped out the caption that was shared with this photograph because I just want to pause for a minute and you look at this and I'm not sure what you might think, what your instant reaction is looking at this photograph. When I first saw it, I think I thought a woman, probably midtown Manhattan, what is she, early 40s, attractive, confident, sitting there with a dog. That's what I felt. So I'm now going to reveal the caption. I'm now going to reveal what this woman's story is. And it's quite small font, so I'm going to read it out to you. My husband had a sudden heart attack a few months ago. It was just a few blocks from here. They called me in to identify his body and then just let me ride out onto 7th Avenue. I felt so lost. My friends were wonderful and supportive, but eventually everyone moves on with their lives. I don't have children and I'm not a workaholic, so I was left with this intense loneliness and void. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. Then one day I started researching dogs that are good for grief and depression and poodle kept popping up. But when I went to the rescue fair, all the poodles were gone. There was this one old dog in the back that nobody was looking at. She was skin and bones. She was trembling and scared and mucus was running out of her eyes. She seemed so fragile. She reminded me of myself. I named her Grace because I think my husband sent her to me. She's my first dog. She's been pure joy. We spend all our time together. She comes with me to therapy. We're getting better together. Wow. Doesn't that change everything? Knowing her story, we now feel something for her. We don't even have to have experienced grief or been through adversity like that in order to empathize. We just need to be human. That is the thing about stories. When we reveal those stories, it builds emotional connection. It turns the story from an otherwise indifference into something we care about. So when we hear a good story, we generate something called oxytocin, a, a empathy chemical. I'm not an expert on this. I won't pretend to be. Paul Zak at the Centre for Neuroeconomic Studies at Claremont is. So do check his work out if you're interested. But he did some research that said that oxytocin, our ability to experience other people's emotions, releases when we hear a good story. It makes us care. And whether we're that filmmaker in Paris or a marketeer in Seattle, we all want people to care about our story. So recently I've been working with um, a wonderful uh, group of women, female founders over here in the UK who are part of uh, a community, uh, a network run by two women who run an organization called We Are Radical. And in working with We Are Radical, I met the woman on the slide here. Her name is Egbe Manton, and she is a lawyer. And she's, got, uh, she's a corporate lawyer, and she's got a side project running a startup law firm. When I first had a call with her last year, I thought, She's great. I warmed to her. I thought she seems what she she knows what she's talking about. She's a good lawyer. But then something changed. I asked her a question. She told me a story. And the question I asked her was, why did you want to be a lawyer? When did that come from? And she said she'd wanted to be a lawyer from the age of seven. And I thought that's really young. And I said, was there a family member who inspired you? A TV show that opened your eyes to what working in a law firm might be like? She said no. She was motivated by something that happened at the time. She was motivated by the case of Stephen Lawrence, 
which was the racist murder of a teenager on the streets of South London, a case that was handled badly by the Metropolitan Police. She was motivated by that racial injustice. She told me that what was going on at the time really affected her as a young girl. And I thought, wow, knowing that changes everything about what I feel about this woman as a professional lawyer. She's a good lawyer, but when you know her purpose, it makes it more human and it makes it much deeper. So I love that. I'm very glad I met uh, Egbe. So good stories come from being curious. And I'm sure a lot of you, uh, I know uh, Satya Nadella uses the word curiosity as a driver, and I'm sure most of you would describe yourself as curious. But I know it's a much used term. Many LinkedIn posts, guilty. I do some of those as well about um, being curious. So how does curiosity manifest? There's a story from my work life that I want to share with you, uh, which all started with a tweet. Curiosity is a really big driver in my life, and I think it sometimes manifests as kind of um, being open minded, um, going where the water flows, if that makes kind of sense as a, as a philosophy, being interested in what's happening around us. So in 2013, February 2013, I was standing on York railway station platform. York is a city in the north of England, and I was going from York to New York City. And it's one of those tweets that, you know, I may or may not have sent. It was just a little random thing. Didn't think about it as I was waiting for the train. And I said, long day ahead, doing the Yorks in one day. I thought, York to New York City, it's got to be something. Yeah, that's the Yorks. Uh, a guy responded to that tweet who, was, who lived in New York. His name is Matthew Stillman. And he said, if you have a spare moment in New York City, I'd love to say hello. And I must admit, my initial response to him was something very standard and um, uh, obvious like, oh, I'm really busy. I probably haven't got time. But by the time I landed at JFK, I thought, you talk about curiosity. Why don't you just meet this bloke, see what he's got to say. So I met Math, uh, Matthew. I met him for coffee. I love my coffee. And we met at Stumptown Coffee at the Ace Hotel, if you know that, where I was staying in uh, Manhattan. And I'm so glad I met him because we had a really interesting chat. And also he told me something kind of like really weird about him. I mean, good weird. Don't worry. Um, he said to me that for the last four years, and this was back in 2013, he said every Friday he um, goes from his home in Harlem down to Union Square, gets the subway down there. He takes a fold up table and two fold up chairs and he sets up a little advice booth <laughs> giving advice to strangers. I'm like, mm, OK, uh, that's interesting. And I was like, wow. And he said, yeah, I've met so many interesting people. I don't charge anyone. I have a cookie jar. You can uh, put money in if you want or take money out if you're a rough sleeper or homeless. He said, I've given advice to a woman who was having an affair, a gangster who was on the run. I'm like, wow, this is this is crazy. Um, and when I went back to London, I kind of had that story filed away in my brain. And then 18 months later, in September 2014, I was pitching ideas to my favorite newspaper, the Weekend Financial Times, for the magazine had a section called First Person. And I thought, I've got a perfect story for that, Matthew Stillman. And on the right is the photograph and the article that I wrote, Matt's story. And it all started with curiosity. So you never know where your curiosity might take you. I think being curious is about noticing the world around us. And I know that in lots of organizations, uh, there's a culture where we're stuck at screens or stuck at desks or working from home uh, and we don't always get the opportunity to go out. Um, for two years, I, I ran a series of workshops for the BBC and I was really keen at getting those journalists out of the newsroom. So I designed, a, it was a day long workshop. I designed a one hour uh, element in the afternoons called Story Safari, where I sent the journalists out for an hour. I said, take your phone, eavesdrop, be super curious, take a photograph, you know, see what happens. Uh, this was taken in Glasgow. That's the BBC building by the river there in Glasgow. And that was just something I saw and posted on Instagram. Wonderful laundrette in Glasgow that I uh, loved. It was such a simple exercise, but giving those journalists permission to be curious and walk around yielded so much. An attendee in Glasgow told me she'd learned more in that 30 minute walk, walking through a neighborhood 
than she had in 25 years driving through it on her commute to work. She had stumbled across a working class cafe and said she she discovered so much about um, uh, what life was like for people living in that neighborhood. So, you know, we're surrounded by a rich seam of human stories. Maybe each of you, uh, if you're allowed to in the current kind of rules, can walk around your neighborhood and do your own story safari. It's kind of like start your own humans of New York, humans of Seattle, or I think Simon's on the call, humans of Farnham, sorry, Simon. Um, so being curious relies on asking the right question. And there's a lovely format, and I've got a link to this in the show notes, called Where Are You Going?, which is a BBC World Service radio format, sadly no longer continuing, but I think outside of the UK, you should be able to jump on the World Service podcast and catch up with the uh, back catalogue. Where Are You Going? is presented by Catherine Carr. She's the woman on the right holding the microphone. And so it's a radio format built around a premise. How do you get stories out of people you've never met before? And the answer is the question, where are you going? In each episode, Catherine interrupts people on their way from A to B and says, where are you going? And it's amazing how much that yields. They did an episode in New York where a woman said she was on the way to visit her son who was dying in hospital, I think. They've done it in Belfast, Seoul, Hanoi, Tokyo, Reykjavik, Hong Kong, Amsterdam, as well as New York and other cities. And what I love about it is who would have thought that the simple question, where are you going, might not just sustain a radio series, but be such an effective storytelling device. Again, tapping into that fact that all around our workplaces, all around our uh, streets and neighborhoods, we're surrounded by that rich seam of human stories. So I love that. Uh, check it out. I hope you enjoy it too. So I know that storytelling can feel overwhelming sometimes. I'm very impressed with the operation you've got, uh, Amy and Steve, and the storytelling team at Microsoft. And I know, you know, in a company of what, 166,000 employees, is it? Um, the sense of how do we tell stories about the organization could feel really overwhelming. Where do you start? And I love this principle that I call zoom in tight which I think is really helpful for anyone interested in storytelling. And um, a good example of Zoom in tight uh, is this BBC documentary that I've got a screen grab here from, uh, which was called Exodus. It was screened in the UK in 2015. Uh, and, it, and it wanted to tell the story of a huge thing that happened in Europe in 2014, which was a mass exodus of asylum seekers and uh, refugees fleeing um, war-torn uh, territories, kind of North Africa, get it, getting, to, getting to Europe. A million people coming to Europe. How do you tell that story as a documentary strand? You don't try and tell a million stories. Exodus, production company that made it, gave uh, 12 individuals or families a camera phone and asked them to record their journey as they, like in this photograph here, coming across the Mediterranean in a, in a dinghy. The result is quite terrifying, quite intimate and, and amazing kind of portrait of the migration crisis. Not a million stories, but 12. When we zoom in tight, especially in a documentary series and spend a few programs with people, we get to know those characters. We feel something for them. Um, and that works just as well in, you know, B2B storytelling or B, um, Look at the work that, uh, or, or employee storytelling. Um, these photographs here are taken from a lovely piece that I really, uh, Amy wrote uh, that was published last August called The Unseen Experts Behind Microsoft's Coronavirus Response. Yeah, I think I've got that right. Again, you'll find a link in your show notes. It was great because it was a piece telling the story of the physicians, the epidemiologists, the data scientists who'd worked behind the scenes at Microsoft um, in, res in response to COVID-19. But why is it a great example? Because Amy didn't try and pick 100 people or 50 people to tell the stories of all these experts and all these teams. She picked five people. And I love these illustrations. Uh, Amy told me that because of uh, constraints from COVID, they couldn't go and take some photographs of these people. And these illustrations were commissioned, which, uh, which look really nice as well. So, you know, it's a really nice way of um, 
telling the macro through the micro. I want to talk a bit about sharing our personal stories, right? Each of us on this call has the opportunity to share a personal story with your team, with your leader or your colleagues. And you may think, what's that got to do with our day jobs? So let me give you an example. It's actually an example from uh, my own life. Um, and, it, and, and this quote from Nancy Duarte, you might know Nancy's work, head of uh, Duarte Inc, a storytelling company in Silicon Valley. Now I think it's in the 25th year. Sharing a story about yourself makes you vulnerable. And that's a lesson I learned uh, myself in 2015. And I should shine a light on it. I want to shine a light on it because it was a real game changer. I got the chance or I got an invitation to go and talk at the Do Lectures in Wales. Do check out the Do Lectures. They're amazing. Um, not for profit business. They ha usually have an annual event. Uh, but a lot of talks online. It's kind of like um, it's kind of like TED Talks in a barn on a farm with no Wi-Fi. And I was told to, um, could I tell a story that I'd never told before? I told a story about what happened to me at the back end of 1999, so 20 odd years ago now. On the surface, I was a very successful young man running um, a media business, had a great team of people working for me, earning loads of money, living the Soho life. Um, but under the surface, it was a different picture. It was the story of a young man who had lost sight of who I really was. And it's a story of a career crash of dealing with depression, poor mental health and changing my life. So it was quite a big deal. I was completely vulnerable. If you look at the video, which is in the show notes, you'll see that I um, yeah, nearly, nearly cried kind of on stage. But it's where I came of age as a storyteller. Why was it game changing? Because you know, I've had people uh, at banks hire me to run an offsite, run a board strategy day. But the reason why I had that initial connection is because they'd seen my do lecture. Maybe they'd seen me nearly cry. They they had a connection with me, right? Here's an example of someone sharing part of their personal story, and it and it revolves around uh, Sachin Adela. It's a 2017, I think, LinkedIn post called The Moment That Forever Changed Our Lives, where Sacha shared the story of how being a father of a son with special needs was a turning point in his life. And the reason I shared this is because and I've shared this many times. It's not, I'm not just sharing because it's Microsoft. I share it at all my workshops uh, and talks is because it tells me volumes about who Sacha is as a human being. Most of you, many of you, I'm sure I've met Satya. I've, I've seen him talk in a, in a room, but I have never met him. I don't know him. But knowing this part of his story feels like I have a connection with him because I'm a human being and I don't need to be a father. I am a father, but I don't need to be a father to feel something when he shares his story. It's a bit like the Humans of New York woman. Uh, it's a fast track when someone reveals their story. It changes how I feel. The good news is you don't need to be super vulnerable if you're thinking I've got loads of things in my personal life and they feel very private. I don't want to share them. And we do have to think about psychological safety. So, you know, that is a does come with, come with a health warning. But this is just a lovely story which isn't vulnerable. It's from a guy I know, a uh, really good friend of mine, Nick Creswell. He's global head of talent at Ørsted, the energy company in Copenhagen. And it's another LinkedIn post he put up a couple of years ago when he got a new job. And we've all seen those announcements. Uh, Ian has a new job. Congratulate him and all the rest of it. Nick decided to kind of connect the dots with his story. When he was young, a young kid, he went to Copenhagen to live because his father was working in the UK embassy there. He had, still had, his little brown suitcase that he had as a kid. And in that photograph there, he had the little brown suitcase and he said, all these years later, I'm going back to Copenhagen to, uh, to live. Uh, and it was just that. But it was a human story. Got 400,000 views in six days. Uh, it wasn't heartbreaking. It was just human. Uh, stories can also drive team spirit when we share our personal stories. Long ago, sheesh, feels a very long time ago. In the old days, I would not just run sessions like this and workshops on teams. I would run it in real life. This was such a setting where I took this photograph 
one November in a country hotel south of London in the countryside where I was working with a team from Thomas Cook Group, uh, 60 people, wonderful team, some of which had never met each other in real life until that day when they had an offsite. And I ended that day of day one of the offsite and I got them all together in the Jacobean Library sharing stories about how they got to here those kind of unplanned trajectories that we've all got in our life. People were super honest, super vulnerable. We went on for hours by that fire. It was an amazing evening and it was fondly talked about by everyone that was in that room ever since. And um, uh, I guess relationships changed as a result of that. Team spirit was fueled and forged and it was um, amazing because people shared their personal stories. We had that fast track to get to know people. So Amy asked me to talk a little about um, the times we're living in and kind of any tips I've got for how do we stay curious and creative when we're working remotely. And uh, curiosity and creativity are, of course, two hallmarks of being a storyteller. So I just want to whiz through uh, a, few little, uh, a few little tips here. And the first one, I love my coffee. The first one is thinking about the creative fuel you need. What you need to do good work and to have good ideas. Um, it's that simple, right? I'm really obsessive about the rituals I need every day. And I've got three things that I need every morning and I'm really tuning into them now while we're working remotely and working at distance and can't go out much, especially here in the UK. I go for a walk on the beach, I live near the beach with my dog and my wife, which I love. It was amazing this morning, check out my Insta. Um, I go and get some takeout coffee or I do a, a home brew in this stove pot, stove top. And I listen to music. And I listen to it quite loud just to get me going. Currently listening to the War on Drugs, if you know that band. We're listening again and again to the uh, same track. Uh, I'm loving it. Next to think about is walking. You know, it's like, what's my biggest creativity hack? You know, biggest shortcut to having ideas. Walk, go for a walk. This is me walking around the town of Leon C. Um, I know that fluid movement in the body can trigger fluid movement in the brain. It's good for mental health. It's great for ideas. So if you're not a walker, try taking your ideas for a walk. Um, journaling. I said at the beginning that uh, perhaps I share something in common with Steve Clayton, which is I get energized when I go on those journeys that I usually take. Well, I used to take before March last year, sitting, having a coffee somewhere, perhaps in a coffee shop I've never been to before, taking photographs, walking around on a plane or in a train, having having those wonderful ideas, looking out the window. And of course, like all of us, I haven't been able to do those for, for, for nearly 12 months now. But I'm really glad I've had a journaling habit for the last 12 years, because in this collection of notepads, you'll see some scans of uh, in front of you, I've got all those doodles and all those little notes I've kept from when I was on fire. And looking at them in the last few months has really helped me and given me uh, some inspiration. Another way to stay curious and tuned into our storytelling muscle is to, you know, we can all do this from our sofas and apartments when we're stuck at home, is when I watch something or read a book or listen to a piece of music, any kind of story, once I'm done with it, I check out the creator behind it. I look for the story behind the story. My wife gave me a book by Adam Hazlitt um, for Christmas, which I really enjoyed. So I you know, kind of dive deep. And I went online and I found a talk he'd given at the Chicago Humanities Festival, uh, which I loved. Uh, I loved the BBC and HBO show Industry that you may have seen. And um, I downloaded some scripts. I just started kind of going through them, got quite geeky. So that's a lovely way to uh, look for the story behind the story. And unearth your own stories. You know what? I think sometimes if you're a storyteller, you forget your own story. I obviously don't because I've spent a lot of today talking about myself, but it does keep that storytelling muscle flexed. I kind of think of it as be your own historian. Last year in lockdown, early lockdown, I went through some old photographs and I was so pleased that I kept this scrapbook from when I was 18 and I went around Europe by train, interrail they call it, get this cheap ticket. And I went to Venice, Florence, Barcelona, Paris. It was amazing. It's like my first storytelling project, a book with journal entries, photographs, like I've got little train tickets there tickets to art galleries. And I really found it a good case study in thinking about story and also connecting the dots between the 52 year old Ian and the 18 year old Ian. So, you know, think about that. 
So before I finish, uh, just looking at the time, yeah, before I finish with my 10 tips, just to kind of recap of how I see the opportunity. I think that the opportunity for business storytelling and career storytelling and brand storytelling is a bit like the doodle of all these little dots that you see in front of you. A lot of us work in an abundant market. There are other people selling similar sounding, similar looking products or services. How do we stand out? Whether it's B2B, B2C, whether we're a global tech company, whether we're a little um, startup in Hackney East London, how do you stand out from all these dots? Shine a light and story. We've all got stories. Every one of us, every business, every product idea has got a story behind it. You don't need to be a jeans business or a Rioja brand. And I've got a lovely hope for the future. Um, a few years ago, I was up in Liverpool uh, running a BBC workshop, I had a morning off and I just walked around, followed my curiosity, went down this street and I was drawn to this shop front because it said wine and coffee shop opening soon. I went, I love wine, I love coffee. I went and peered in the window. And when I did, I saw this sign in the window, the advertising for staff. But it doesn't say send us your resume or your CV as they call it in the UK. It doesn't say send us your resume. It says send us your story. And that's my hope for the future. Forget resumes, stories. So next time you're recruiting someone for your team, please ask them your story or their story. So we're kind of at the start of 2021. Hopefully I've given you a bit of a refresher. Now I wanna give you 10 tips just to go through uh, that might help on your storytelling journey. The first one is a story needs people. I think I've proven that today with all the stories about David and Claire, Satya, me, Egg Bay Manson, we need people we can relate to and identify with. No humans, then it doesn't have an emotional context, okay? Number two, shine a light on the customer. If you wanna talk about how good your product or service is, why don't you talk about, why don't you shine a light and get the customer doing the heavy lifting, why they love it so much? There's a lovely series of brand films from the German Sach um, sandal company, yeah? Birkenstock. Lovely brand. Um, it's in the show notes. This is a screen grab from one of those films. It features an Alaskan fisherwoman called Charlene McCollum. The film doesn't talk about Birkenstock as a product. It's like four minutes long or three minutes long. It doesn't talk about Birkenstock as a product. It doesn't talk about the functionality of the sandals. It tells the story of a woman who's doing an arduous job out in the outdoors, out on a trawler, and how at the end of the day, she takes comfort and freedom in her Birkenstocks. It's just such a lovely example of bringing a brand to life through story. Simplicity, number three, is a really important hallmark of a good story. Don't overcomplicate it. I went to a talk a couple of years ago at Oxford University by a guy called Lane Green. He is editor of the Economist magazine Espresso app, which delivers subscribers five quick read stories, and they're only like 150 words a story. His tips were use pub speak, talk in the kind of language you would in a pub or a corner shop, a coffee shop. Plain language really helps, short sentences. It's not dumbing down, right? It's about good storytelling. Number four, I've talked a lot about curiosity. I feel you should all kind of lean into the screen with a pair of scissors and cut out that pass, that badge, uh, uh, a license to be curious. Good storytelling is about good listening. Talk to your customers, talk to your colleagues, look around you. Don't gloss over the grit. If you're telling a story about the organization, about your team, or a career story, a personal story from the last 12 months, you cannot do it without mentioning what we've been through on this planet, COVID-19. And if you, if you gloss over it, you're really missing a trick. There's a great quote from Richard Branson who said, a long list of successes does not make for a good story. You need that grit. You need that grit in order to have the emotional engagement, right? Lift the lid. Um, when I go in as a storyteller for hire into an organization, I always think about kind of like my kids Lego, you know, they've made a building, you lift the lid and look inside. And I thought about that when I spoke to Steve Clayton last year and Steve Clayton told me this lovely story about Thames Valley Park, which is an aerial photograph of the Thames Valley Park campus. Some of you may know it very well. 
to just outside Reading to the west of London. Steve told me that he used to go past Thames Valley Park when he was in the UK and he'd see the five Microsoft buildings there. He said there were five grey buildings looked like grey boxes. He wondered whether that was how some people saw the company as a grey box. So he, as a storyteller, your chief storyteller, wanted to show people all the amazing things that are happening inside the box. And that, that is the job of storytelling. I love that. So lift the lid and uh, show people what's inside the box. Number seven, zoom in tight. I think I've made that point about Amy's piece. To make your story stick, you've got to zoom in. Don't try and talk about too many people. Just have a few characters. It's a photograph I took on the beach there of some family. I hope they didn't mind me taking a photograph of them. Um, and tell your own story, right? As we build relationships with other people, maybe you know new people are starting the build, uh, starting at Microsoft or starting your team, they're being onboarded remotely. How do you get to know those team members fast? Sharing a personal story. We all have that opportunity. This is me at the age of uh, seven or eight, I think. There we are, always the storyteller. Got a pair of binoculars. I probably got a notepad and pencil in my little satchel. See, look, I didn't have a television to watch. Poor, poor kid, I had to get out in the countryside. <laughs> uh, paint a picture, number nine. You know, I've done it, we all do it naturally. I was telling Amy before the call about arriving in Madrid, some strange story I put, put on my Instagram yesterday and having to try and feed a rabbit. You know, you, we naturally paint a picture. In 2012 and 2013, I had a side gig writing for the Financial Times and I developed my own style where I'd start every piece setting a scene i'd say it's a tuesday morning in london it's a this is an example here uh, it's a saturday afternoon in late august and a group of business students is out on a roof terrace at microsoft's new england research development center alongside boston's charles river you don't even have to have been there but you might get a feel for it by me painting a picture it gives the audience something to grab hold of and uh yeah, very nice building. I'm sure uh, some of you know it. I guess it's still there, is it? The Nerd Centre. Uh, great to go there and to uh, to visit MIT. And number 10. I love this cartoon by Tom Fishburne. Make your audience care. You need to think about your audience, whoever that is, whether, uh, you know, that's an internal or external audience. Who's going to fall in love with a story? What's going to make your story stick? How can you make them care? So that's my 10 tips. I just want to finish with this lovely example. When I can go on a plane again, I want to fly Air Iceland Connect. That's an Air Iceland Connect uh, aircraft on the right there. They do short haul flights up in Iceland and they don't have an in-flight entertainment system. So you won't be able to watch a movie or uh, catch up on a documentary. What they have in the seat pocket in front of every seat is a hardback book called Shared Stories, and they ask the passengers to fill in that book and write a little story or do a little illustration of where they're going or why they're taking that flight. And I love that, superhuman. So uh, yeah, here's to some stories. And uh, I'm now gonna uh, stop screen sharing and uh, go back to Teams and hopefully we can uh, see if we have any questions. You're back. I'm back. Thank you so much, Ian. That was tremendous. I feel like we did achieve campfire status. Both oh, good. <laughs> in, in the moment and also in the attention you can feel from everybody. I hope you can go back in the chat and look at the comments and emojis and applause and right. um, get a sense for how the conversation was going. Um, so thank you. I think a lot was gain from your tips. And there was a lot that um, I think was such a great way to start the year. Um, I've got to ask you a lot of questions. So I'm going to, given the time, give the folks on the line the first stab at it. I should say, by the way, I cannot see chat. When I try and go over it, it says I don't have permission to look at chat. So if there's anyone asking in the chat, you might have to, you might have to read it out because I, I, uh, I don't have permission. That's beyond my pay grade. Maybe we should cut. We should copy and paste it for oh, you. Oh, that'd be so great. I'd love to see. It. Thank you. Look at <clears> it. You're getting a lot of compliments on your PowerPoint skills as well. 
thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Um, are there any questions? I think go ahead and go off mute if you'd like to chime in and ask in the last few minutes. Um, yeah, here we go. I see one. Uh, there was a, something about a customer story uh, for B2B products. Um, John's saying it was a great example, and, and he's wondering it's harder to get an emotional connection for those types of stories um, for so B2B somebody, think, customer. Uh, do you have an approach or, or any quick tips on, on how to think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I, I hear the point. I think you how do you get that emotional engagement? I mean, you know, in B2B, um, I think MailChimp do storytelling really well. And MailChimp, you know, don't talk about, well, I mean, they do talk about product features, but in some of their storytelling, they just talk about the difference it made to someone's business that they used MailChimp. And that difference can be kind of transformative. And I think if you shine a light on that bit of how the customer feels, it was like suddenly they got loads of business by having a MailChimp newsletter. Um, I think you can always find that angle. It might be harder with some products. Might not feel that emotional, but I think if you just ask a customer, a lovely question is, you know, how do you feel about our product? And I think you then get all this unraveling of, of passion and, oh my God, it's changed my life, makes my business easier or whatever. That's a great tip. Um, there's a few folks that have their hands raised and, and someone that, oh, there's Mo and, and Amika. Um, Mo, why don't you jump back in and then Amika. Great, thanks. Hi, Ian. Hey. Great talk. Thank nice you. Nice to see you. I've taken nice my camera you. off. Hopefully, encourage other people to show their faces as well. Yeah. Uh, so, um, I love what you said, you know, bring it into focus. And I wonder for more technical stories. So I work in uh, M365 Core. So there's a lot of technical pieces. There's a lot of fun stories and things in customer. But one of the things that it would be great to get your perspective on, like right now I'm working on a really complex story that involves like the stack and data science. And, and it's so interesting and there's so many different tentacles. And of course, when you talk to a data science and a designer and a PM and the engineer, everyone is like, this is an important point. Uh, you know, and you look at all the different pieces. And, um, and so I just wonder when you work on something technical like that, you know, is there sort of a process or are there any tips or tricks? You know, I have things that I've used for a long time, but um, I'd love to kind of hear your approach and learn a little bit about, you know, how your brain works and how you'd approach something like that. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's a, a smart question. I mean, I think... Uh, you know what, I think for me, it's just about um, going that human led approach. Like there's all that complexity and, you know, maybe sometimes it's like, what's the innovation story or there's a technical product, but like, where did the idea come from? I'll always go for the human angle all the time. And I wonder whether sometimes you can kind of try and stand back from that complexity and go, what is the common thread about all the different cross discipline team that are working on it? You know, we've got different people in different territories. What's the spirit of it? I think always look for the human angle would be uh, would be my take. I know we haven't got much time. So yeah, I'll go go yeah. for the human angle. I love the common thread idea too. Um, Amika, since your hand is up, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, do you want to jump in? Sure, I've just got a quick question and it's about timing of being vulnerable. Um, so I think sometimes when um, the light is shown on you. I think it's a good time to kind of expose some vulnerability and then the message sticks. But I think if the message or the vulnerability is shared earlier, it may lose its impact. So I wanted to get a sense of when is the right time to be vulnerable? Yeah, I mean, look, that's a really good question. I think we do have to be careful. I, I didn't have a time to talk about it in detail, but you know, I talked about psychological safety. I'm going to be really honest. In 2015, I stood up and shared my real story about my struggles, uh, my struggles in the workplace with mental health. It took me 15 years. You know, that I'm talking about what happened in 1999, 2000. It took me 15 years. 
please don't wait 15 years to share a story that could be that transformational. But look, joking apart, you know, I had to be in a place mentally where I was okay to do that, where I was like, I can do this now, you know, and it was still hard. So, um, and I wish I'd done it earlier. No, seriously, seriously, you know. So I think it can take time and there's no magic wand about when is the right time. I would always, you know, refer to people around you who are trusted, whether that's coworkers or whether that's a partner or family members, because you don't want to expose yourself. You, you know, I, I am very cautious when I'm running something in a room. People are sharing stories that they got to look after their own, um, their own well-being. It's a hard one to get right because you're right. Sometimes you get the opportunity, come and do a talk. We're doing a little chat. You know, here is your time. But I, I, I suppose it's difficult to give a definitive answer. I think everyone's different, but give it really careful thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And thanks so much again, Ian. This was just fantastic, really. Um, appreciate the time. Everyone will share the recording and we'll share Ian's tips and, and follow-ups that he mentioned. So um, you can hit him up after this. I think it's probably safe to say that if there yeah. are lingering questions, folks can get in no, I'd touch. Love that. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, and let's stay in touch, please. I've enjoyed speaking with you over the past few months. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, I've really don't enjoyed forget it. I to fill out the survey too. There's always a survey. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, have a good storytelling journey in 2021. You've got my social uh, addresses at the bottom of the PDF. So, you know, stay connected, uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. And uh, I look forward to staying in touch with uh, with all of you. And thank you for the people that have the opportunity to uh, to ask a question. And thank you for your lovely comments that may or may, may not be there on chat, but I trust Amy, <laughs> I'm sure they are. <laughs> It was a load of fun. Thank you so much, Ian. Have a great rest of your evening. Cheers. Take care. See you. Bye. -bye. Bye.